we're in the same spot in the Senate we've been at five times before in the past 12 months. My Senate colleagues are bringing up a bill on voting to federalize our elections. This time's different. This time, their demands have changed. It's not just vote for my bill or take a vote. It is, if you don't do this, we will blow up the Senate permanently. Oh, that's a different thing. So let me set some context on this, because this requires some conversation about where we are, what this conversation is all about, and what this really means for the future. So first, let me begin with the bill itself. There's no question 100 senators here have all been through an election process. We're all experts on elections. We've walked through it in a way that most Americans have never walked through before. We're passionate about fair elections. We're passionate about the people who actually vote, because those are the people that are actually engaged in our society. As we have millions of people that check out, don't care, don't vote, we encourage people to vote, to pay attention. The laws in our states are a little bit different on voting, because each state is a little bit different. That's not something new. That's actually written into the United States Constitution. It's been that way since 1789. They've always been a little bit different. In 1965, our nation took a strong, bold step to be able to make sure that we protected the rights of every single individual to be able to vote, because there was a season in American history where black Americans were being pushed out. There were poll taxes, there were Jim Crow laws, there were things that actually pushed people away from voting. So in 1965, our nation passed the Voting Rights Act. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. That Voting Rights Act still stands today to be able to protect the right of every individual in America to vote. If a single person or group of people are suppressed in their voting, are prohibited from voting, federal courts today have the right to be able to step in on any jurisdiction, any state in America, to be able to protect the rights of individuals to be able to vote. I bring that to this body as a reminder because for some reason, an enormous portion of this body on the left side of this room are running around the nation and saying, if we don't do something right now, there'll be voter suppression in America, and we have to change that. When they all know in 1965, we passed the Voting Rights Act, and that act still stands today to be able to protect the rights of individuals. I hear people wander around the nation and get on news channels and say the Voting Rights Act has been kicked out by the Supreme Court when they know that is a lie. They know it is. One section of the Voting Rights Act the Supreme Court took out several years ago, it was the section that required what's called preclearance. It created a formula for states that had done a lot of oppression against black Americans. It created a certain formula for them. If they made any changes in their voting laws, they had to get preclearance for that. It stayed in place for decades, even though their state had cleaned up their voting laws and had changed for decades, it stayed there. And so the Supreme Court looked at it and said, you can't hold this over these states a generation later for something that a previous generation did. And so the Supreme Court kicked that one section out, but kept everything else, including protecting the rights of every single American from voter suppression. Every law in every state in America could be challenged in a federal district court, circuit court, into the Supreme Court to make sure the rights of individuals are protected. Now, people here may not know that that still exists based on the way that the news has talked about voting of late and based on all the conversation about voting. But that is the law of the land right now. So what's being brought to this body to vote on then? Well, here's what's been brought to this body to be able to vote on a long list of things that they want to be able to address 
and to be able to say they want to change voting in America to be able to remake it in their image. Except it's not in the image of their states because many of my Democrat colleagues don't actually have in their own state the things that they're actually putting into this federal legislation, meaning literally they're taking over from officials in their own state, telling their own governor, their own legislature that they're wrong and that they're going to set them straight. We have a disagreement on some of these issues. I'll grant that. Some of the areas in their bill we look at and go, let's talk about. Most of the areas in their bill we look at and go, are you kidding me? We just disagree on this. Things like same-day voter registration, where a person could literally walk in, say, I've never registered to vote before, tell them their name, and then vote on the spot. Honestly, I have a problem with that because there's no way to be able to validate that they didn't vote in Oklahoma City and then go vote in Tulsa and then go vote in Muskogee, Oklahoma. There's no way to know. They just voted and they did same day registration. And so there's no way to verify that person's actually really even that person. Interestingly enough, they also include in their bill undermining state voter ID laws. So the combination of the two is pretty powerful. You can't call for ID, but you can register on the spot. That is a formula for fraud. It's not just my opinion. It's the state of New York's opinion. The state of New York does not have same-day voter registration. In fact, this last November, it was on the ballot in the state of New York, and the people of the state of New York overwhelmingly said that's a terrible idea and voted it down. Yet Senator Schumer stands right over there and tells every state, including his, that just voted this down, no, you have to do this. We're going to require it because some people in this body think it should be required. We have a disagreement on that. That's a real disagreement we should be able to debate and talk about, but instead my Democrat colleagues are saying, if you disagree with me on this, I will blow up the rules of the Senate and will get what I want no matter what. Can we not have a disagreement that same-day voter registration may be a bad idea when even the state of New York and the people of New York think it's a bad idea? They have a mandate for using ballot drop boxes. Now, I don't have a problem with ballot drop boxes, but their ballot drop box issue is you can't provide security. You can't, if you have any kind of security setting for it or any kind of chain of custody requirement, then that's going to be oppressive and suppressive. You know, I think it's a good idea if you're dealing with a ballot that you actually know where it went and if anyone changed it. If, a, if people dropped off multiple ballots when it's only legal to be able to drop off one, I think that may be important to be able to know if you're going to be able to verify an election. We have a disagreement on that. We have a disagreement on the issue of felons voting. Now, each state makes that decision where they're going to allow felons to vote, but in this piece of legislation Democrats are bringing, they're saying no, Felons have to be given the right to vote when they get out of prison. Now, I understand we may disagree on that, but I want you to understand what they're saying. My Democrat colleagues are saying, I will blow up the rules of the Senate and change 250 years of history in the Senate to get my way if you don't allow rapists, convicted murderers, and convicted sex offenders to be able to vote. They are so determined that sex offenders get the right to vote, they're willing to blow up the rules of the Senate to get it. Can we not have a disagreement on if we're going to force states to mandate that convicted murderers, sex offenders, and rapists get to vote again? In this piece of legislation, they provide government funding, taxpayer funding, for members of the House of Representatives, just down the hall over there. Here's the way they set it up. If you're running for the House of Representatives and you raise small dollar donations, then taxpayers will fund your campaign on a six to one match. Oh, it gets even better because you as a candidate could actually take a salary from that as well and actually be paid by the taxpayer to be able to run for office if you're running in the House of Representatives. Can we not have a disagreement on that? I don't meet many people in Oklahoma that say they want to fund House members running in New York State 
or California or Illinois or even in Oklahoma, they don't want to fund them with their tax dollars. If their tax dollars are going to education or to roads or to national defense or to border security, they're all in. But if they're funding a political campaign with their tax dollars, I just don't meet very mean people that are very excited about that. But my Democrat colleagues are saying, if you don't support that, I will blow up the Senate and I will destroy 250 years of history in the functioning of the Senate to get my way because to them, having federal funding for elections is so important, they're willing to blow the Senate tradition up so they can get their way. There's a general counsel that works for the Federal Election Commission. You've never met him. You don't know his name. He's an attorney that works for the Federal Election Commission. Their bill gives that attorney a tremendous amount of power to oversee elections in America. Do you know who he is? I don't either. But if this bill passes, it's a pretty powerful individual. Can we have a disagreement about that? Or is this about if I don't allow someone no one even knows their name in the Federal Election Commission attorney to be able to run elections in the country, I'll blow the Senate up. There's a section of it in this bill that talks about preclearance. We actually don't know how many states would fall into preclearance on this. Many of my Democrat colleagues say, well, it's not very many. You have to have some sort of violation in the past to be able to get it. But actually, if you read the fine print in the bill, it says if there's been a consent or an out-of-court settlement on things related to an election any time in the last 25 years, you would suddenly now be in preclearance. So literally 20 years ago, if your state made some agreement on elections, if there was some settlement that was done with DOJ during that time period, didn't even go to court and you just settled it to resolve it and said, yep, that was a mistake, that was done. Now that's gonna come back to haunt a future generation. And states will get drawn into preclearance, which let me just describe what that means. Preclearance means your state legislature can no longer pass legislation on elections until you contact the Attorney General of the United States and ask permission first. So now your state legislature works for the Attorney General of the United States, whoever that person may be in the future. It actually gives them the ability to be able to control anything on election law in your state, even though we don't even know who that is and we don't know how many states are actually included. What I've heard over and over again from my Democratic colleagues are, well, if we don't do this right now, our elections are destroyed in the future because have you seen the things that Republicans are doing all over the country? Have you seen the terrible laws that have been passed since 2020? It's like, actually I have. My state's one of them. And I was surprised when I saw my state on the list of 34 different laws that are out there that have been passed that are terrible for America. So we've got to be able to federalize all elections. I was surprised to see my state on the list. And so when I looked on the list to see what was the terrible thing that passed in my state, here's what I discovered. Our bill, our state passed House Bill 2663. House Bill 2663 did a couple of things. It added an extra day of early voting for the general elections, added an extra day of in-person early voting, and it said if you request an absentee ballot, you have to do that 15 days prior to the election. Do you know why we did that? Because the United States Postal Service contacted every state and asked them to do that. Because the Postal Service said we can no longer guarantee we can get something mailed to a person and give them time to get it actually mailed back in time for the election. So to make sure people's votes actually count, we did what the United States Postal Service actually recommended to us. We moved our request for an absentee ballot to 15 days before the election to make sure every vote would count. You wanna know something fun? So did the state of New York. 
They made the exact same change. So apparently, the state of New York is also into voter suppression, the same as the state of Oklahoma is. But you know what's really happening? My Democratic colleagues are running around the nation, getting on the news and saying there's 34 new laws passed by Republicans. They're destroying the right to vote. And apparently, no one in the media is saying, list one. Because if they would have listed one, they would have listed the state of Oklahoma, added, added an extra day of in-person voting, and did what the United States Postal Service asked us to do, the exact same thing that the state of New York did. Let me give you some other things that have happened in other states. In Florida, there's a requirement that voters provide the last four digits of their Social Security number or their driver's license number or their Florida ID number when they request a mail-in ballot to make sure it's actually them. It's pretty straightforward. That doesn't sound like voter suppression. That sounds like just verifying that a person is asking to vote by absentee is actually the person voting. They made it very simple. You could just do any numbers. They're not even showing ID. They're saying you just give the last four digits of your Social Security number, which everyone has. All they're just trying to make sure is that person's actually there and is actually who they say they are. But they're listed as being voter suppression there. Arizona is requiring a voter signature on early ballots, as do a lot of states already. That's not been a big issue on that. In Louisiana, here, oh, this is a really big one in Louisiana. Louisiana and Utah, now I understand why Democrats are challenging this. In Louisiana and Utah, they required that deceased voters be take, taken off the voter rolls. Those that are deceased, they're taken off the voter rolls. That's being listed as voter suppression. I have to tell you, I, I have a friend of mine that said to me, when, when I die, would you make sure that I'm buried in a blue state because I wanna make sure I can continue to vote? It's a running old joke about, I wanna keep voting when I'm dead. The state of Louisiana and the state of Utah, all they did was say, we wanna be able to clean up our voter rolls to be able to take off the names of people we know and have verified that they're actually dead. But that's considered voter suppression. And my Democratic colleagues are running around the nation saying there's 34 new laws that are suppressing the rights to vote when this is the kind of stuff that's actually been passed around the country. Now they'll say, oh, well, you, you can list those. I, I understand those. But there are a couple of them that are really egregious. And I've heard several folks say, do you realize that the state of Georgia, the state of Georgia in the law that they passed won't allow people to be able to pass out water to people in line. That is voter suppression. Well, did you know that new law in Georgia has been the old law in the state of New York for years so that you couldn't campaign in line? People that are actual poll workers that are volunteers there, they can pass out food and water. But the state of Georgia did a law just like the state of New York already has. I haven't heard... Senator Schumer say that's voter suppression in New York, but he declared that to be voter suppression in Georgia. In fact, even Georgia senators here stood up to be able to protest that they were playing baseball in Georgia because of it. When the state of New York already has it. I've also heard folks say, well, there are some of the, some of the things that these states have passed that they're actually removing the ability of the state chief election official to administer elections. That's dangerous because then just the legislature can just declare whoever they want to declare. That sounds horrible. If true, that would be terrible. It just doesn't happen to be factually true, but it's just getting spun like crazy that Republican states are out there taking away the rights of their people to be able to vote and their vote be counted. It's just not factually true. They'll go to Georgia and they'll say they stripped the Secretary of State's authority to oversee elections. Well, here's what Georgia actually did. The Georgia Secretary of State's still the chief election official for the state of Georgia. They still oversee all election activity in the state. Nothing changed on that. But Georgia did replace the Secretary of State on the state election board with a nonpartisan chair. 
making the Secretary of State a non-voting member. That did happen. The law did provide new authority to the board to suspend county or municipal election superintendents and to appoint superintendents to oversee the jurisdiction. Yep, that's part of the law. But this only happens, that would only happen after an investigation by a performance review board, a hearing by the state election board. The board then must determine that the election administrator and the jurisdictions committed at least three violations of state election law or has demonstrated nonfeasance, malfeasance, gross negligence in the administration of elections. The law also prohibits the board from suspending more than four superintendents. It allows for a suspended superintendent to petition the state for reinstatement. It has a whole process of due process that actually gets carried out. Why do they do this? Well, because there were actual examples in the election of election workers that were fired by the county elections directors for shredding voter registration applications. That's a crime. So they set up a process with full due process, not to overturn elections, but to make sure county election officials actually are following the law. That doesn't sound like voter suppression to me. That just sounds like running free and fair elections. Oh, but Arizona. Arizona has a new law that provides the attorney general to have the authority to defend the state's election laws in courts rather than the secretary of state. So they just shifted their responsibility of who defends state election laws. Secretary of State's still the chief election officer in, in Arizona, but actually doesn't go to court. Their state attorney general does. That kind of makes sense to me. But apparently, my Democratic colleagues don't agree. They've spun this whole web of myth and said we have to federalize every election in America. We have to take over every state voting system in America. Washington, D.C. needs to be the one to be able to run everything. Or else if we don't, we'll destroy the traditions of the Senate and get our way no matter what. Can I just read to you from the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the law that's still in place in America? It says, no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision to deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or color. Voting Rights Act of 1965, still the law of the land. and should be. So what's happening now with this? Well, there's two big issues here. One is this fight over voting, whether states make decisions on voting or whether Washington, D.C. Democrats make states on voting for their states, even if it's a Democrat state. And then the next big issue is Are the Democrats in this room actually going to destroy the filibuster and silence the rights of the minority in America? Now, if you would have asked me four years ago, I would have said, no way. That's not going to happen. Because a group of Democrats and a group of Republicans joined together and said, we are committed to not destroying the legislative filibuster. Why? Because it's what makes the House and the Senate different. The House and the Senate are not just one's bigger and one's smaller. The House and the Senate operate differently. And the Senate has been the place for two and a half centuries where the debate occurs in the rights of individual senators to be able to debate the issues, defend their state, talk about the rights of Americans, this happens in the Senate. The majority rules the show in the House. If they have 218 of 435, they don't care what the other side thinks. People, when they talk about bipartisanship, never bring up the House of Representatives. They just don't. 
Bipartisanship doesn't happen in the House of Representatives the way it happens in the Senate, but the reason it happens in the Senate is because of this thing called the filibuster. It was interesting, when I was first elected into the Senate in 2014, the people that called me between my election and when I came were almost all Democrats, almost all of them. They want to introduce themselves. They want to say, what are you interested in? Because in the Senate, we have to work together to be able to get things done. And so I had all these Democrats that reached out to me to say, let's start trying to find areas of common ground. We're going to disagree on lots of things, but let's find the things we're going to agree on. Because we have to come to consensus because we're the United States Senate. That's commonly understood by senators, which is why in 2017, in the middle of the year, a group of Republicans and senators wrote a letter, this letter, to Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer. In that letter, I'm going to read it right here from this paragraph. It says, we are mindful of the unique role the Senate plays in the legislative process, and we are steadfastly committed to ensuring that this great American institution continues to serve as the world's greatest deliberative body. Therefore, here's their request. Therefore, we're asking you to join us in opposing any effort to curtail the existing rights and prerogatives of senators to engage in full, robust, and extended debate as we consider legislation before this body in the future. This group of senators in 2017 wrote to Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and said, do not allow any changes. We are fully committed to making no changes in the filibuster. Don't allow it to happen for legislation. Don't allow it. Here were those that signed this document and said, this is what we believe. Kamala Harris, now Vice President of the United States. Chris Coons, who led the letter among all Democrats. Patrick Leahy, who's the person who's held this institution together. Dianne Feinstein, Amy Klobuchar, Kirsten Gillibrand, Cory Booker, Michael Bennett, Joe Manchin, Angus King, Mark Warner, Bob Casey, Martin Heinrich, Jaheen Shaheen, Sherrod Brown, Brian Schatz, Maria Cantwell, Maisie Hirono, John Tester, Tom Carper, Maggie Hassan, Tammy Duckworth, Tim Kaine, Jack Reed, Ed Markey, Debbie Stabenow, Sheldon Whitehouse, Bob Menendez, all said, don't change the legislative filibuster. In fact, they asked me, along with everyone else, to join them in opposing any efforts to make changes to the filibuster. It didn't just stop there. There were lots of other conversations that happened during that time period. There were lots of interviews and dialogue about it. Let me just read some of the comments that were made during that time period. George Stephanopoulos on ABC's program asked of Dick Durbin, the number two leader for Democrats, asked Dick Durbin, what do you think about doing away with the filibuster? Dick Durbin replied this in 2018. Well, I can tell you that would be the end of the Senate as it was originally devised and created going back to our founding fathers. We have to acknowledge our respect for the minority, and that's what the Senate tries to do in its composition and in its procedure. That's Dick Durbin in 2018. John Tester was asked in 2019 about the legislative filibuster, and he said, I don't want to see the Senate become the House. He then said, if you're asking me about the filibuster changes, I'm a no. That would be a mistake. Senator Angus King made this comment in 2020. He said, I know it can be frustrating, but I think legislation is better when it has some bipartisan support. Senator Dianne Feinstein in 2020 said, the filibuster is part of the Senate tradition, which creates a sobering effect on the body, which I think is healthy. One more comment from Angus King. Angus King was asked about it on CNN about the filibuster, and he replied back he's 
100% opposed to killing the filibuster, 100%. Senator Cory Booker responded about the filibuster. He said, my colleagues and I and everybody I've talked to believe the legislative filibuster should stay there and I will personally resist efforts to get rid of it. Senator Chris Coons, when asked about this in 2018, he replied, I am committed to never voting to change the legislative filibuster, never. Senator Jackie Rosen in 2019 was asked about this and she replied, I think we should keep the legislative filibuster. It's one of the few things that we have left in order to let all the voices be heard here in the Senate. She also said, we have to look not at just when you're in the majority, but what does it do when you're in the minority? You have to be mindful of that. Jean Shaheen was asked on CNN about the legislative filibuster in 2021, and she answered just simply, no, I would not support eliminating the 60 vote threshold, would not do it. Senator Jack Reed was asked in 2017, during the same time period this letter came out, which he was a signatory for. He said, the, the filibuster is not in the Constitution or in the original Senate rules, but we have a bicameral system for a reason. And this legislative tool serves, as a critical, uh, serves a critical purpose in ensuring the functioning of our democratic republic. Yes, it sometimes slows the process down, and some have abused or subverted it, but it remains an important part in our system of checks and balances. I agree. I agree with that, Jack Reed. Senator Bernie Sanders even was asked about the filibuster in 2019, and he just replied, no, I'm not crazy about getting rid of the filibuster. Senator Maisie Hirono from Hawaii said, I'm not particularly in favor of getting rid of the filibuster because that means majority rule, and that's what happens in the House. Senator Bob Casey was asked in 2019 about the filibuster, and he just replied, I'm a yes on keeping the filibuster. One of my favorites, Senator Sherrod Brown, was asked about this in 2019, and he replied, I think there are ways of getting things through Congress with the legislative filibuster still in place. It just takes a chief executive that knows what she or he is doing. Listen, this is not some trivial exercise. This is 250 years of history, my Democratic colleagues are planning to flush down the toilet because they don't get their way. On a bill we rightfully have very strong philosophical disagreements on. Hey, I don't agree on giving rapists and sex offenders who are convicted felons voting rights when they get out of prison. I'm not alone in that. I don't agree in federal tax dollars being used to be able to pay for political campaigns. I'm not alone in that, that's not that crazy. I don't agree that my state should have to go play mother may I with some future attorney general because they want to add another day of voting. I'm not alone in that. But to say, if you don't do this now, I'll destroy the Senate is a toxic shift for our republic and is a violation of what you have said before in public, in fact, written to the leadership of the Senate and said, please don't do this and we will not do this. And now years later go, it's not convenient. That was when we were in the minority, we had one opinion. Now we have different core beliefs because we're in the majority. Interestingly enough, Joe Biden today stood in Georgia and made this statement. He said, today I'm making it clear to protect our democracy. I support changing the Senate rules whichever way they need to be changed to prevent a minority of senators from blocking action on voting rights. When it comes to project, protecting majority rule in America, the majority should rule in the United States Senate. Well, that's fascinating. Now that he's president in the United States, it is my way or I'll destroy the whole place. When he was Senator Joe Biden, he had a different opinion. Senator Joe Biden wasn't about, I'm the president so I get what I want. Senator Joe Biden said this statement, folks who want to see the change and eliminate procedural mechanisms designed for the express purposes of guaranteeing individual rights 
and they also have consequences. They undermine the protections of a minority point of view in the heat of majority excess. But now he says, no, I'm in the majority. I should get my way. Senator Joe Biden said, well, I've been here 32 years, most of the time in the majority, he said. Whenever you're in the majority, it's frustrating to see the other side block a bill or nominee you support. I've walked in your shoes and I get it. Getting rid of the filibuster has long-term consequences. If there's one thing I've learned in my years here, once you change the rules and surrender the Senate's institutional power, you never get it back. Senator Joe Biden said, simply put, the nuclear option would transform the Senate from the so-called cooling saucer our founding fathers talked about to cool the passions of the day to a pure majoritarian body like a parliament. We've heard a lot in recent weeks about the rights of the majority and obstructionism, but the Senate's not meant to be a place of pure majoritarianism. Is majority rule what you really want? It's what he said as a senator, but as president, his demand was majority rule or we'll break every rule in the Senate to get what we want. Senator Schumer, in his public statements, has been very clear it would be doomsday for democracy, he said, if you change the filibuster. This is the statement Senator Schumer made in 2017. The same Senator Schumer that has spent the last 12 months trying to find a way to tear down the filibuster. In 2017, when there was the debate going on around this, Senator Schumer sat on the floor of the Senate, standing right there. I hope the Republican leader and I, he said, can, in the coming months, find a way to build a firewall around the legislative filibuster, which is the most important distinction between the Senate and the House. Without the 60-vote threshold for legislation, Senator Schumer said, the Senate becomes a majoritarian institution like the House, much more subject to the winds of short-term electoral change. No senator would like to see that happen. So let's find a way to further protect the 60-vote rule for legislation. That was Senator Schumer in 2017. But now it is, I'm in power. I'm going to do what I want. This is not a flippant issue. And as I've spoken to some of my Democratic colleagues, they seem to believe we'll just take this vote and no one's going to care. In fact, some of my Democratic colleagues are saying, we know we're going to lose. Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema have already made public comments. They're not going to go with this, so we're going to take this, make a statement. Our progressive base wants us to be able to do this. It has no consequences. It's not going to pass anyway, so we'll just do it. Except they're forgetting that five years from now, 10 years from now, there'll be another time just like this. And maybe Democrats will be in a slightly larger majority. And maybe Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin won't be here at that moment. And the majority leader Democrat senator at that point will step forward and say, you voted on this in 2022. It's time for us to vote on it now. And Democratic activists will rush at you and will say, don't you dare change what you did. Tear the place down. Let's get what we want. I've spoken to so many of my colleagues and said, don't do this. And they've quietly responded back to me, I don't want to do this. I'm not here to attack my colleagues. You each make your own decisions. But these are decisions that matter. These are the decisions that a hundred years from now will still guide the direction of the Senate. These are the decisions that will direct our republic. We are the only body 
that has a protection for the minority voice. I think the only legislative body in the world that's designed like this. And it's been part of the secret sauce of America that the minority in America, however large or small it is, has a voice. My Democratic colleagues are now saying we no longer want the minority to have a voice in America. If you're in the minority opinion, you don't count. Sit down, shut up. We're in the majority. That has never been the American way, not in 250 years. This has been the place where we've argued, debated, and where, yes, I've talked to House members who've said good bills went to die. But the Senate has been the spot where all Americans get to speak. And my Democratic colleagues are seriously considering this week saying no more. Because we want to pass a voting bill that gives federal dollars to House candidates and gives felons the right to vote and takes away voter ID. What in the world? What has this body become? that people who signed this document, page after page of them, I mean, I can bring out page after page of senators who have signed this and have said, do not take away the legislative filibuster, that now are just flipping and flippant and saying it won't matter. Yeah, it does. A hundred years from now, this week will still matter. I encourage my Democratic colleagues to think carefully on this one, because this one counts. With that, I yield the floor.